Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the May 20th, 2024 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30 p.m. This is an in-person live stream meeting format, and members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak to use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. And as a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light on your microphone is on and you're prepared to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify and please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates may speak and ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comment. Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet. Please do sign in. And at this time, TAC members and alternates here in person will introduce themselves. We'll start over here, Jessica. Jessica Mickledust, Colorado Department of Transportation, Region 1. Carson Priest, TDM Special Interest Seat. Grant Soderland, Arapahoe County, representing Littleton. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Vicar Lakewood, in Jefferson County. Evan Ash, Town of Frederick, Southwest Well County. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge. Jeff Dankenbring, Arapahoe County, from City of Centennial. Michelle Riccio, Adams County. Mormon, Adams County, City of Thornton. Matt Callison, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora. Hi, good afternoon, Sean Poe, City of Commerce City for Adams County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest Seat. Holly Wirt, for each special interest. Hi, Frank Bruno, via Mobility Services. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog Staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Brimfield. <laughs> Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. John Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Angie Rivera, Mall Piedi, Special Equity Seat. Ed Rivera, Non Motorized Special Interest Seat. Chris Quinn with RTD. Hi, Jean Sanson, City of Michelle Malanakis, Boulder County, City of Lafayette. Uh, Justin Schmitz with City of Lone Tree, representing Douglas County. Chris Hudson, Douglas County, County of Parker. Uh, more Regional Air Quality Council. Oops, Jennifer Bartlett, City, County of Denver. Justin Begley, City, County of Denver. Lauren Curtis, Dr. Cog, staff. Gaspers, City and County of Denver. Thank you, everybody. We will now open the meeting for public comment, and public comment is limited to three minutes. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up your line. As a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in part discussion regarding each agenda item. Do we have any public comment at this time in person? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't see any hands raised in the room, and I do not see any hands raised online either. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item, which is the meeting summary from the April 29th, 2024 Transportation Advisory Committee meeting summary. This is attachment A in your packet. Are there any discussion, questions, or corrections to the March 25th meeting summary? Okay, seeing none, the meeting summary shall stand. Today, we do not have any action items on the agenda. Um, we do have a few discussion items, and the next agenda item will be um, Item number four, which is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment 
and strategy. This is attachment B in your packet. Um, this will be presented by Chris Valdez, Plan Implementation Program Manager. Technical difficulties, <laughs> just one moment. Hello, I'm Chris Valdez with Dr. Cog's staff, and I'm here to provide you an update on the Regional Housing Needs Assessment and really look to you to provide input on the strategy framework we're developing and initial strategies. So we really want to leverage the unique expertise of TAC members and their role with Dr. Cog. So I just want to tell everybody where we are in the process and what we know to date. And we have a great foundation established, understanding the need regionally, and we are on track for next steps to develop strategies to address the needs. And we really want to continue to integrate and align regional transportation investments with housing investments. Last time RPD was here, we were presenting the preliminary findings for the regional housing needs assessment. We are now looking at assessing the barriers and potential strategies. We are going to be asking for your input as subject matter experts on incorporating transportation into future housing strategies. So what's been learned so far, I just quickly want to remind folks what the Regional Housing Needs Assessment found was the entire region needs 511,000 units by 2050 to meet underproduction and demand. Total number of housing units in the Denver region now is 1.4 million, just for reference. So a quick summary of key findings, housing production has kept pace with population growth, but there is historic underproduction. Lower incomes make up the greatest need in the region, and with the population aging and a trend towards smaller households, the region will need to deliver diverse housing stock. Existing housing types and levels of affordability are unevenly distributed throughout the region. So over the last five months, we have engaged close to 200 stakeholders. We convened our member government staff early in the process, along with our climate and resiliency staff and stakeholders. We've had eight focus groups, conducted over 20 one-on-one -on -one stakeholder conversations, and throughout the process, we have leaned on the guidance of over 25 subject matter experts to help us shape and analyze the information that we are gathering through our advisory group. So right now we have a preliminary report on barriers. So the barriers are placed into five different buckets. You've got zoning, land use, and regulatory process barriers, and balancing affordable housing incentives while maintaining fiscal responsibility has become challenging due to increasing, uh, increasing subjective, lengthy, and costly permitting processes. This complexity arises from conflicting goals such as affordability, sustainability, transit-oriented development, and preserving neighborhood character. And then we have got construction and finance barriers, which include market forces, including labor, materials, and interest rates, impact construction, all impact construction costs, which are further impacted by state construction defect laws. Thus, there's a necessity to cultivate resilience and development to withstand fluctuating market boom and bust cycles. And then we have infrastructure barriers, the high costs associated with adding or expanding infrastructure coupled with the need for capacity expansion to support electrification efforts, presents significant challenges. 
Additionally, reliance on metro districts to fund infrastructure improvements coupled with, coupled with uncertainties regarding long-term water availability and sometimes difficulty tra with transit services further compound, compound these challenges. And then we've got ongoing funding for below market rate housing. Limited funds and incompatible requirements between funding sources pose challenges, especially for smaller communities that lack staff capacity to seek and manage grants. Additionally, addressing the needs of residents at risk of homelessness is hindered by insufficient funding, staffing, and units, while the cr criticality of these needs is often not weighed appropriately compounded by subsidies that fail to make housing truly affordable and inadequate organizational capacity for managing affordable developments, including the preservation of existing affordable housing. And last, political will and collective action barriers. A lack of understanding and opposition to growth driven by fear of change contributes to resistance against necessary developments. Also, the absence of a collective will to distribute growth impacts exacerbates these challenges. However, barriers are experienced differently in different communities. We are still working through these barriers and we'll have a summary in the coming weeks. And now we want to, we want your input on this. Well, in the event that this happened, <laughs> we do have a backup plan. <laughs> so in the event that this happened, so this is going to be our first question, but I'm going to go grab my computer with a Mentimeter code on it, and then I can verbally say it to everybody. Hang on a second. Always have a backup plan, right? Okay, so the Mentimeter code. So everyone, everyone should go to Mentimeter on your device if you. Yes. So it's Mentimeter.com. So the code is 93. Oh my gosh, now this is like really small. All right. <laughs> Gotta lift up my glasses. All right, 93570528. So it is 9357. Zero five two eight. The first question is an easy one, just to get everybody in there. <laughs> so, 
So the first question is, are you excited about connecting transportation and housing? And it's yes, yes, or yes. That's what you should be seeing. Okay, it looks like we have uh, quite a few people in there. You have to take my word for it. Everybody caught up? Think you are where you're supposed to be? Everybody got the first test question? Okay. All right, so as you are aware, the bipartisan infrastructure bill provided additional clarification around housing in the metropolitan transportation planning process. As you think about these considerations, which considerations seem most relevant for the Denver region? Please choose one of the options taken directly from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Now I know it's gonna be hard to see on Mentimeter when I start it, but these are your three options and you get to choose one. I don't know if you're also thinking or you're now looking at email on your phone. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh. Question two is how would a housing strategy or other reports or analysis be most helpful to your work in transportation? This is an open-ended paragraph question. You all moved ahead. Okay, I'll just read some of these answers since we can't see it on the screen. Allow the locals to plan and present to the state to determine adjacent roadway, roadway capacity. If capacity is lacking, lo lacking locals, must present a plan. I think this was before transportation options. More strategic TDM mode shift efforts around plan density. Need help getting past local opposition. It can help to offer context and help rationalize plans. Dense housing locations will drive travel demand needs on our roadway infrastructure. Identify priority corridors for investment. Local decisions necessary, not state directives. Can people afford to work and live in the same area? If the state is involved, they need to bring funding. Recognize that there are legitimate impacts on transportation with increased density. Just because you provide bike lanes and access to transit doesn't mean that people won't still need and want a car. Origin and destination info. And for some reason, it's not letting me see the second page, but thank you for that. And then I just wanna give everybody an update. We are finishing up phase two of the regional housing needs assessment. We're reviewing, assessing those barriers and then the initial strategies. That's May, we are having our final advisory group meeting, June 5th, and then we're gonna prepare the final regional housing needs assessment report in July and have that hopefully delivered to the board at their second meeting in July. And with that, I'll open it for any questions. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that update and soliciting our input. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Cog's staff? Jessica Micklebest. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think last time we talked about this, we were curious if the if you had the numbers for the 2023 to 2050 housing needs and what is the current number with what is being constructed currently. 
Um, there's a lot of, you know, housing units being constructed currently. So is the 518 taking into account all the things that are being built and we still need 511 or is it all the things being built minus 511? Yes, it is taking into account what is currently being built and we still need 511,000 units. At Mormon? Just a little more clarification on it. That's under construction now or planned to be under construction that's approved by the cities? And the yep. Sheila's coming up. Hang on one second. And, and the reason I ask is, for instance, for the last three years, Thornton hasn't allowed any developments, or if they come in it's on their water, we just got our last 10 miles approved are building that line. So the question is, I will probably see, or we believe we'll start seeing some development, development come in. These are great questions. And I think the way the the general methodology for coming up with the 511,000 was looking first at underproduction. So looking at numbers to understand kind of what's our shortage now looking at people that may be doubling up, um, people that may not have started households that typically would if there was the housing stock to do so. So a part of the 511 is that what we're calling underproduction, it's really like a housing so shortage. And then the um, additional is future need. So we looked at what, is, what are the growth projections across the region out to 2050? What's the current housing stock? and what's needed. So it did not look at like pipeline of projects by jurisdiction. So as Chris said, 511,000 is what we'll need by 20, 2050, but I know a lot of your jurisdictions already have projects in the pipeline for, for additional units. That help? On top store. Very well, just a, just a quick follow-up. So I, I, I think the question that we're hearing is, I think there's an understanding that the forecast is a total need of some 500,000 units between now and 2050 be produced. I think the question that I'm hearing, and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, is there's some sort of historic production level of total housing over time. And if we sort of assume what we expect to have sort of as a, as a production level, like I, th I think there is there a gap, I think between now and 2050 of additional units we need to account for over the course of the next yeah, 25 great. years. Yeah, great, thank you for clarifying that. So one of the things we're finding looking at current production rates right now is that Generally speaking, our region is probably in better shape than most regions in, in, in having a kind of ideal or good production rate right now. What we're overcoming is we had about eight years of underproduction. So there's a little bit of catch up that we need to do because even at the current rate, we probably won't address all of that underproduction. Does that help a little bit? And then the other thing I'll add is that one of the things Chris mentioned about our key findings is we're seeing that when you look at what our needs will be move, moving into the future, looking at um, kind of age, um, kind of our growing 65 plus population and also a trend towards smaller households, what we're producing may not meet all of the needs into the future. So part of what we're seeing is that we're going to have to diversify the types of housing we build as we move into the future. Pat Callison. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Sheila, uh, clarification. <clears throat> I think many of us would be interested in terms of how the housing cost or value, the different sectors or different groups, if you will, quartiles, uh, how that relates to our population and the wage and salary scale that better match those and ideally on a in a spatial context how do we how do we co-locate those on the jobs housing side of things uh, to minimize uh, drive to qualify long distance commutes uh, costly commutes etc on that so 
Yeah, and that is something that our consultants did a wonderful job of looking at when you look at, they used area median income to try to understand kind of uh, income levels and then current housing that's available based on price points. And one of the things that we're seeing is because the cost of housing has dramatically risen, not at the same pace as wages, we are seeing um, what what we would call like people are maybe staying in a housing type that typically for their income level in a in not such a hot housing market they may have bumped up to a to a different type of housing type and so that filtering down is happening so part of it is looking at okay how to, over time what do we need to meet the demand but also um how how do we naturally create more um, options throughout the cycle so that there's less filtering down? So I'm not sure I have a perfect answer for you, but I hope that that shows you a little bit more. Thank you. And there's more to come, I'm sure, with yes. with phase two with your analysis. Yes, definitely. Ongoing. Appreciate that. Holly Weir. Uh, one of the things that I would like to particularly mention is that from a freight standpoint, you need to allow for delivery of goods and services. I've seen too many road networks and new developments where street width has been minimized for rooftops and it creates severe problems. You know, you get a UPS truck in there and a garbage truck and nobody's going anywhere. So I would encourage you to take into effect that the economy has changed and there's more delivery services, there's more of those types of things. And even if you need repair services, please make sure you've got a sufficient street network to handle that because otherwise it becomes extremely frustrating. Great point, thank you. David Gaspers. <clears throat> Back to the underproduction, Sheila. Uh, just for one more clarification, I guess. So uh, or our production is okay or, or better than most others right now. We had eight years of underproduction. I guess how far back are we then? How big is the gap we need to catch up? And I would presume it would be advantageous to catch up sooner than later. We don't want to catch up in 2050. We want to catch up sooner than later. So I'm just wondering how, how much do we need to, there we go, okay. So these show the numbers um, for underproduction and future need. And the homelessness need, part of that is really an underproduction count. What that looks like is people right now who are experiencing homelessness, to address homelessness, we would need homes for them. So it's kind of an underproduction, rolled into underproduction, but it's just a little bit different than the underproduction category in this chart. Um, that's a really good question. It's like, so when we look at the 52,000 that we have under production, what would it take? Like, what's the length of time it would take us to get caught up? I'm not sure we have that exact number yet, but, um, but it's certainly something we could start looking at as based on the current rate of production we have now. I don't, I don't have that number today or that time frame. All great questions. Any additional questions or comments? Kent Mormon? So what is the current rate of production? Mentioned 50,000 or something like that. Is that the current rate or, is, or what is it? Because if it's over 30 years and it's 50,000, you, you, you're... You're right on to something, right? We could figure this out. I don't have that number right in front of me right now. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think it's a little misnomer saying we need 511,000 new housing units. Don't disagree with that, but do you truly, when you look at production rates? Great. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, that is wonderful. Um, I was just going to add to just a little bit on timeline. Chris mentioned, so we wanted to come to you to give an update um, report on this, on the, on kind of our progress to date. We are still in the midst of um, compiling what we're calling second phase, which is uh, identifying the barriers to, to addressing housing need. And then by the end of July, we should have a full report from our consultants, and we'll have a lot more of these details to share with you. 
sorry that the Mentimeter didn't work. We were hoping to spend most of our time hearing from you to understand the kind of what you see as the priorities moving forward. Uh, we will be kicking off a housing strategy come August after we finish up the housing needs assessment. And we certainly want to be in step with this group to understand the alignment with um, transportation planning and investment along with building our housing strategy. So really appreciate you allowing us to take the time today um, and We'll come back to you soon with more information. Jacob Rieger. Uh, Chris, if you still have access to them, could you verbalize the results of the first Mentimeter question, the multiple choice? Bipartisan? Yes. Type. Okay. And if you don't, we can send them out later. So 12, so number one had six votes, number two had nine votes, and number three had 12 votes. Hey, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Matt Callison. Thank you. Uh, question for Sheila or for Chris. Uh, your anticipated schedule for phase two uh, with uh, strategies and, and coordination with, with stakeholders and pursuing for moving forward. Sure, yes, great. So we will be um, releasing an RFP um, in the next month or so, and then we hope to have consultants on board and kind of ready to roll by August. We anticipate this next stage, which we're calling the Regional Housing Strategy, to take a full year. And our hope there is that as Chris presented, and I'll go back to these, one of the things, that these, are, these are kind of the five categories that are emerging in our needs assessment around what are the barriers to addressing housing need. Our, what we anticipate is as we move into the strategy, which will kick off this summer and last a year, we will be addressing these barriers on some level. With that in mind, part of, there's a lot in these barriers that local governments, Dr. Cog, don't necessarily directly impact. And so what we'll focus on is, in the regional housing strategy. Oh, and I should add, there's some of, some things in these five barriers that our local governments are already addressing. They've already created initiatives or programs to address some of these barriers. So what we hope to do in the housing strategy is to understand what is that important nexus with transportation investment and transportation planning, and also what are those key things we can work on regionally? We certainly don't want to duplicate efforts that are happening at the local level. So these five buckets are pretty broad. So we'll be zeroing in on what are those things that we can work on across jurisdiction regionally to address housing needs. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, what, is, uh, what are some of the early takeaways from the stakeholder engagement that you're hearing so far? So the takeaways are actually where we got the barriers and then we have input on the strategies which are forthcoming. But really what we were asking the groups was the input on where they were experiencing barriers to building housing, whether that be affordable, whether that be market rate. And so these are the five things that we heard from our stakeholders. And it wasn't necessarily the public, it was developers, infrastructure groups, um, Let's see, uh, oh, local government planners, things like that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any additional questions or comments? Jean Sanson. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so it sounds like you're going to be issuing a, an RFP with a scope of work for this next phase. Is it going to incorporate the slew of land use laws that have over the last several weeks? A great question. It's been a busy spring when it comes to land use policy. Um, and so, yes, as we move into the strategy that will kick off this summer, we will certainly, we have new context, let's say, to address um, uh, land use policy. And so, um, Certainly, like uh, House Bill 1313, which focused on um, creating greater density around transit 
and then also Senate Bill 174, which talked about housing assessment and housing planning. Those two in particular, there's several others, um, parking minimums and some other legislation. So those th that new context will be built into how we move forward with a housing strategy. And one of our hopes is to um, build into our strategy what are the ways Dr. Cog can support our member governments in implementing both the state level policies, but even local policies that uh, local governments have taken on to address housing. Does that answer most of that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Sorry, I can't, I can't see your face, so that <laughs> wasn't sure. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you very much. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Cogstad? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this update, and um, thank you for the robust discussion. I appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is item number five, the Denver Regional Council of Governments data tool. This is attachment C in your packet, and Byron Schultz, Senior GIS Specialist, will present this item. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, like was mentioned, my name is Byron Schultz, a senior GIS specialist at Dr. Cog, and I'm here today to present to you a public uh, tool that is available to use. Um, and some of you may have heard of this. And I'm actually just curious, raise your hand if you have heard of the Dr. Cog data tool. Wow. Well, that's great. Um, I'm glad people are using it because uh, it took me a lot of time to build. So. Um, <laughs> That's great to, great to see. So um, one thing I just wanted, to, for those of you who haven't um, used it or don't know about it, what is the data tool? So it's a browser-based mapping tool. There's a little image of the new version on the right, which I'll get to, but it allows you to explore regional data sets um, easily without having to download them and use your own software, um, and also to and analyze a project location or area of interest, um, which is another powerful use case. So this was a version of this tool was launched for the TIP application process, and it is um, plan planning to use that going forward for TIP applications and filling out some of the information there. Um, another use case may be to assess safety issues or exploring demographic data, and I'll kind of do a little demo so you can see what that looks like. So we did launch a new version, and that's really why I'm here, is you're familiar maybe with the old version. So why are we doing that? Um, the first reason is because the software provider is sunsetting the platform the old one was on. Some of you who have used it may have thought this does look kind of like old, um, an old kind of uh, look and layout. So in this one, uh, the layout and design are a little improved, it's a little more organized and easy to, easy to navigate. Um, and then the last reason is accessibility. There have uh, obviously been six accessibility guidelines given to us um, by the state, and this uh, new version meets those. So there are mostly similarities, just a few differences between the two versions. So all the data that you saw in the old version is included in the new version, and there's even a couple extra um, data sets in there. The analysis functionality um, is, is, looks different, but the functionality is all there um, the same, and I'll show you that as well. And the data layers are organized into groups. You may have recalled there was just so much data in the last one. You had to scroll through 12, 15 layers. Now they're organized. It's a little bit easier there. So yes, overall, the, the layout is just cleaner. Um, I'm happier with it, so hopefully you will be too. So how do you access this? Um, I've set up this URL that now redirects you to the new version. So that is gis.drcog.org slash data tool. Um, that's in the slides. So the previous version will remain available. If you are familiar and want to get something done quickly, that link is going to be up. Um, and so the welcome screens for the new version and the old version both contain this information. Um, the old version will take that down on July 1st, but until then you can access it. So I'm going to see if I can get this to work, but I'm going to do a brief demo and make sure this is visible to folks. Over. Excellent. Okay. 
So um, this is the new version. So as promised, you have a welcome screen that allows you to go to the old if you don't want to deal with learning a new one right, right now, but it isn't that hard. So if you click OK here, there are instructions on the left um, that guide you through the use of this, but um, I won't read those off. I'll be demoing it. So the first thing, uh, the most important component of this is probably your layers icon here. Um, and this is where you can get at those different um, data categories. So for example, the transporta transportation system data category includes a lot of RTD transportation infrastructure, the regional roadway system, um, things like that. Uh, the safety category includes crash data um, and the regional vision zero um, Hindry network critical corridors. So the rest of them are fairly self-explanatory for your, your own exploration there. But obviously, like the old one, you can look at any of these on the map. Um, for example, the regional rapid transit system, you can just click that, that icon to view it, pan around and zoom in. Um, in this case, the, the legend icon is right here. So if you want to look at what are, the, what are all those symbols mean, um, just click that and you can get, get that information as well. So long story short, just like the old one, you can explore a lot of these um, just interactively like that. But there is also the ability to analyze um, an area of interest like the old one, which is maybe a more common use case. So I'll show you how that looks in the new version. So I just kind of picked out this ahead of time. So let's say I'm, I have a project coming in here um, on Alameda, just east of Savannah Street. What I can do is go to the data tab um, and then draw my project. There's also the ability to add your own custom data as a zip shape file. Um, and so for th those who are more technical, they may want to use that as well, but you can also draw. So I have my project, so I draw it here to here from this intersection to Peoria, double click, and then automatically you get um, a buffer that gives you results on some of the layers that are in this tool. So for example, um, you can get crashes by severity that are in that area, and you can also look at those on the map to like that. So you can look at them in real time. The crashes by severity or by mode, for example, um, and then you can look at, if you're more interested in demographics, you can look at this equity index data set so you get ideas about um, the population, low income, youth, all, all those things, all the same kind of things that were in the old one. So um, the other thing is you might be thinking, well, for safety purposes, maybe I don't want to go half a mile as the default, but I want to go to 0.1 miles, so you can change that. So again, that's similar to the old version, but um, yeah, just allowing you to, to do this custom analysis and understand what's around a, a project. So, um, and then I can just delete that if I want to start over. So in sum, um, the new version, hopefully this is a little bit of a cleaner layout, allows you to explore those regional data sets and visualize them, but then also to go deeper and do that analysis. So um, let me see, I'll just close that and move to the questions, if there are any questions, I can open it up now. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Byron. Thank you for that presentation and the demonstration. Um, any questions for Dr. Cogstaff? Kent Mormon. I'd just like to say this has been a very useful tool and uh, appreciate Dr. Cog doing it. it. It has helped a lot on a lot of our applications, not just for the tip. Excellent. Glad to hear it. I will echo that, um, you know, using it for the TIP applications, but not only uh, for those purposes, but it's great for local planning purposes as well when we're looking at transportation projects in our community. So really appreciate the integration of this data and really appreciate the updates and the new functionalities. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Cogstad? Great. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item number six, the 2021 regional crash data. This is attachment D in your packet. Eric Broughton, senior planner for Crash Data Consortium will present this presentation. 
And Chair Grant, if I could, while Eric's walking up to the podium, just to introduce this a little bit. We actually talked about this last month as part of the Regional Crash Data Consortium update. Um, there was some interest and conversation around our crash data. So we thought it would just be helpful uh, for Eric to come back and just give a little bit of a verbal um, about the crash data that we have and that we process at Dr. Cog. Thanks, Eric. All right, thank you, Chair Grant, and thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we do have available. I do want to encourage you all, um, as we just saw the great presentation on the data tool, if that is helpful for your purposes, whether for TIP or for other applications, um, it's a great tool out there. If you do have access to GIS in your government or organization and you have skills with that or you have uh, team members who can use it, we do offer data that, we've, that we have geolocated geo and done a lot of value adding to. So the data that we have at Dr. Cog is derived from the, is derived from the CDOT data. Um, we work with CDOT pretty extensively to QC things. We work with them to when we notice things that seem off or that we don't understand, we've developed a really good relationship where we can um, have that back and forth conversation. And we get this data, we take, we're able to geolocate the crashes that are on the non-CDOT system, and we're able to then go through and we have a team member who goes through and actually checks all of those records we consider high priority, which are all fatal, serious injury, um, and non-motorists, which is going to be your pedestrian, um, bicyclist, and um, a motorcyclist. And I think there's a few other categories that fall under that, but those are the general ones we consider high priority. So we go and check over, in this data set, I believe it was over 3,000 individual records for the spatial accuracy of those records. So we wanted to make sure that this was available for and for our local governments, for other agencies to use because we spend a lot of time adding these fields to it to make sure they actually do as well. And we also go through one thing that is a really um, cool thing that I believe that kind of makes this data set unique in, in addition to the just the geolocation of the records is we've gone through and updated some of the fields, so not changing the values of them, but changing how they're represented. So there can be a little bit more easily read. We do include the data dictionary and some information on how it's put together, but it's also combined in the geodatabase that we've developed where the links that, the way that the form is, there's multiple tables that relate to each other. And our analysts have done the work of doing that relating, putting it all together and doing calculations that will allow, allow individuals with the access to this to look in and do their own analyses without needing to really understand the ins and outs, the, the back, all the, all the specifics of the data sets. We've done the hard work for you and we hope that it's useful for you. I'm going to just really quick show where on the website this can be accessed. If you go to just our main drcog.org, um, right here under services and resources, you're gonna find what we call our regional data catalog. Also, it's able to be accessed easily just through the search function here on the top right of the screen. And once we're here in the data catalog, this is pretty easy to find. All you have to do is search for crash. And we have data on the website from 2013 all the way through 2021. They are listed as individual data sets for those years. So if we are interested in 2021 as the most recent set that we have, all we need to do is search this and it'll pull up here. We'll click on see data. Get a little bit of information just about the vintage of it, last modified and calling out that the original sourcing is from the Colorado Department of Transportation and a brief description. If we go to get data, this will just give us a download link where we can access the file. This will give us this little zip, zip, uh, zip file with the folder inside. And what we have included is data dictionary for the two types of, of data that go into this or the, the geodatabase. 
So in 2019, the state went through a pretty extensive process working with Dr. Cog and many, many other governments and organizations to redo the crash report. And so the original crash report, or the previous crash report was this DR2447, and it was amended and into this new form, the 3447, which was a pretty radical change to the, the way the document was structured. And so we were able to, and so for, there was a period of time when law enforcement agencies could submit on the, the, the previous 2447, and then they had kind of a grace period to which they could then get on to the 3447. At this point, um, I think the last conversations we've had with um, our partners at the Department of Revenue and CDOT is, I believe that everyone is using the DR3447 at this point, but in this year's period, the 2021, both reports were coming in under both formats. And so, again, our analysts went through and worked on how to, how to relate those to each other and combine them to create a new schema for the data so that both, type, both forms of those data went into this um, data set here. We have a quick guide here, which talks about a lot of what I've already said here and gets into more detail that um, we don't need to today, but that's available. And then the actual file is as a Esri um, file geodatabase, and that is a format that is able to be accessed in multiple GIS platforms like Esri Arc, GIS, Arc Pro, um, QGIS is another software, There's, and a few other programs that are able to access that. And so we just want to make sure this is available for everybody. Um, we are already actually working on our 2022 product, and we can anticipate that to be ready um, within the next couple of months, and we will make that available to you all as soon as that is. And if there are any questions about these data sets or how to use them, um, please just reach out to me um, reach out to our, or reach out to our um, GIS team. We are happy to walk you through them and do what we can to make sure that this is not just here for you, but here and it's useful for you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for that update. Any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? Well, seeing none, I w wanted to say I appreciate the work by Dr. Cog and, and CDOT to um, consolidate this crash data, ensure accuracy of that data, and for all the local jurisdictions to access. And glad to hear that the next um, crash data report will be ready soon for 2022. Thank you. Um, the last uh, informational item on the agenda is um, item number seven, which is fiscal year 2024 Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, also known as ATIP, the discretionary grant informational form. This is attachment E in your packet. Um, and Jacob, did you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Chair Grant. I'll just say a couple words on this. Um, continuing our practice and protocol that whenever there's a major discretionary grant, uh, we do ask potential project sponsors or applicants to fill out um, these project information forms. We do include them in the packet um, as part of these transportation advisory committee meetings. Um, again, not that folks need to present on the projects, but more that you all are aware um, of what your neighbors and, and friends and stakeholders are considering uh, for projects under these discretionary grants. Um, so for this one, we did receive two informational forms, uh, one from the city of Littleton and one from the city of Wheat Ridge for this grant program. So we wanted to share that with you all. Thank you, Chair Grant. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, any questions or comments about the ATIP uh, grant application? So we're wrapping up here. So administrative items, item number 10, member comments or other matters. Seeing none. Hey, seeing none, I think Jacob has one more update. Perfect segue from the ATIP program. Just a reminder that our 2024 Bike to Work Day is June 26th. All right, that's true because our next meeting will be for, before the break to work day. Um, so our next meeting will be on June 24th, 2024. If you did not sign in, please be sure you check in at the sign in table or Dr. Cog staff to be sure you're registered as attending. And uh, we will all see you at the next meeting and have a great holiday season. We are now adjourned at 224. Thank you. <laughs>